You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Young Buck. Young Buck. Yeah. What's up, son? What's Feel up, my good brother? good to be here, man. What's up, big bro? I can't call it, man. Chilling, man. Getting to it. About time, man. You got some music out in the album out, man. It's been a long time. Feel good to be out here just with something fresh. Something different for the streets and just following up with the whole campaign. You got a storied history though, Buck, man. I, 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 life. How long you been around now? Man, in this game, I probably met Baby back when I was 13 going on 14 years old, just chasing my dreams. It started with him, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And then- uh, So you, were you originally, were you signed to Cash Money or just nah, affiliated? I never got to the paperwork part. Uh, Thank God. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Nah. But was it actual? Was it him or was it just juvenile? Nah, juvenile was after Cash Money. Honestly, I had started with Cash Money. I spent my life from 14 to probably 19, mm -hmm. 20 years old, or just being amongst the camp. You know, you can go pull up the World Chemo Sabi videos, uh, them all my cars and me and my people cars in the Hum video, the yellow Ferraris mm -hmm. and all of that good stuff from way back. Um, like I say, the whole push in the beginning of me coming around Cash Money was to kind of make the picture, dress the picture up in a sense. Mm -hmm. That was my way with my circle. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I think it was more of a situation where Cash, where the hot boys had really started to take off and that became the full focus. And I had looked up and like I say, I'm 19 years old. I've been around here, you know what I'm saying, back and forth from Tennessee, from Nashville to New Orleans. And uh, I just decided to go ahead and go on about my business and, and, you know, take my own journey. So I took what I had learned throughout my years from 13 to 19, went back to Nashville, you know, came back because I felt like, you know, I wasn't getting getting that look out of baby or cash money. So Did they I'm, present you with paperwork to sign a deal? Did they Nah, get thank that God. <laughs> In Charlemagne's voice, nah. <laughs> but that happened with Juvenile, because the first time I met you, you right. were on Juvenile. So UTP. Yep. Juvenile yep. was doing That's my the first my time I ever met album. you. Without and then that was the first time I met you. So what happened with Juvie? Well, after I came back to Nashville, I started my independent grind. That's when I really started to experience you know, seeing money from the business because back then it would only cost you three hundred dollars to press up a thousand CDs. Mm -hmm. I was selling them for ten dollars a piece. Kind of slowed me down from in the streets because my music phone started working more than this other phone. You right. dig? And uh, out of that whole uh, experience of that led to me getting a call again from Baby. Mm -hmm. You know, this time it was more or less, yo, I'm about to start this uh, group called Headbusters, and uh, the group was supposed to consist of me. His nephew Derek, which is deceased now, uh, Lack. God bless the dead. Yeah, God bless the dead. Cadillac, mm -hmm. and another guy by the name of Stone. He died in prison with me. You know, uh, so you know, at the end of the day, I went back to go try to make it happen. You know what I'm saying? I'm 20, 21 years old. Mm -hmm. Then growed up. I got a local buzz now. I got a few local records out, and I just went back to make that journey happen again with him, and it it didn't happen. But in the process of being there. You know, things wouldn't like how it was when I left. Uh, I got there, I'm like, where Manny, where Baby, where, where BG, you know? And I would ask Baby that. I'm like, yo, where, where's the other guys? And he he just basically was like, you know, they're around. After being there for like a week or so of sitting around, I started to get a little itchy. Like you said, I, I done became a man now. It ain't like I was a child. Mm -hmm. I got things going on at home and I came with that mind frame like if it ain't no business here for me, I'm going to keep it moving. Right. And uh, Juvie happened to pop, pull up at the office, and when he pulled up, uh, he was kind of shocked to see me there. I'm like, I've been here for a whole week. And uh, he was like, man, you want to get up out of here for a minute? You know what I'm saying? And uh, I took that ride with Juvie, and that's where my career started with Juvenile, because mm -hmm. on that ride, he was explaining to me his situations and what he was going through with Baby, and not just him, everybody was having their different little situations. And he just said something to me that stood out. He was like, look, man, you've been around the camp for a long time, bro. And, uh, you know, I got my differences or what or what not, but I got my own thing going, which is UTP. I got my own artists. I can't make you no promises, but I will promise you, you will get heard over here. Mm -hmm. That's all I ever wanted from, from anybody was the opportunity to be heard. Let the streets be the judge of me. Right. So I just told you, hey, man, run me back over to the office. Let me get my, my, my luggage. I never looked back. 
Wow. You know, next time I seen Baby, man, honestly, man, was uh, at the MTV Awards, <laughs> straight up. How wow. did you even get in or involved with Cash Money from the get-go, though? Honestly, man, it was just me in the in the car with my homeboys. You know, we we been out here in these streets at a young age, you know, and uh, really getting to it, Charlemagne, for us. That goes, and uh, we picked up a CD at the time. I think Chopper City in the Ghetto mm -hmm. was that extra city. And BG was making a lot of noise throughout the South. Like, he was, that was the wave. And on the back of the CD, they had booking information. And one of my partners had called the phone playing, you know, just jokingly. And, and when the, whoever picked up, it was like, yo, how much y'all want for a show? And like I say, I think it was around about 5,000 for the whole crew at the time. I remember and, those days. Yeah, straight up. And uh, he just, uh, we, once we heard that, we was like, what? Come on, you know, we, we went and found a spot. It really wasn't even a full show, but we brought him there. Like I say, we wanted to meet the dudes. And baby seeing how we was getting down, you know what I'm saying? He was kind of amazed of us being so young and the whole crew, you know, moving how we move. And that kind of bonded the relationship, uh, started the relationship mm -hmm. right then and there. And it was it came through my brother, little Jimmy. You know, he's been gone for 10 years. He recently just come home. And uh, you would hear Baby make little references to him at, back in the day in the music, you know, mm -hmm. flying to Tennessee, chilling with little Jimmy, and transporting coke back and forth through my city, things like that. He would make little different references, but my relationship was developed through him, basically through my partner, mm -hmm. because he, you know, kind of took to the whole situation of him. And I just stayed on it, just trying to get myself in, and it didn't work out the mm -hmm. way, because uh, they ended up going to prison. My whole circle went, into like top 10 biggest situations in the in the world. So it was like half of my circle left mm -hmm. and I was here by myself. And everything that was being told to me really stopped then. You know what I'm saying? Once they was gone, they mm -hmm. was kind of more the individuals that was kind of keeping the business in place with baby and pushing for me to be there. They ended up leaving, going to prison for all these years. And I, that's when the contact really kind of started to really slide away. And that's when I slid away, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. So that's basically the beginning of that. And, and the process of being with Juvenile is what led me to meeting 50 Cent, though. Mm -hmm. Juvenile got you hurt? Yeah, Juvenile got me hurt, but it wasn't getting me hurt enough to where 50 hurt me. Mm -hmm. It was just about Juvie was, like I say, going through a situation. He was up here dealing with a lawyer at the time. We had a bus driver, uh, go by the name of CeeLo, who still rocks with Baby to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a relationship with Shy Money, which was uh, 50's manager at the time. Mm -hmm. And like I say, soon we got up here, the wave of what he had going on with the mixtape circuit and everything, I have really, I had known of him, you know, from back in the G where he, and, and a little bit of his story, mm -hmm. but the wave was so for real that when I got up here, I'm like, man, dude, dude now bump me. Mm -hmm. And um, like I say, uh, Shy Money had that relationship. CeeLo was able to get in contact with 50, 50 came over the bus, not for me, but for Juvenile. Juvenile, yeah. People do a record or something, right? Yeah, they did. They, I ended up getting on the record on 50 Cent of the Future, the record that, uh, a little bit, I think that's what it's titled. Mm -hmm. It's a, a record with Juvenile, and I'm actually on that record. A lot of people kind of fall and don't know that's really was the first record I actually was. It was on a mixtape with, mm -hmm. with them. And uh, from that process, I was playing a song, though, in the front of the bus. And it, it it touched Banks enough to the point where, you know, he went back to get 50 in the back of the bus, like, yo, bro, you gotta hear this. What was the record? It ended up being Bloodhound on 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying. Oh, wow. Straight up, I already had that record. That was my record, you know. Uh, once 50 situations had happened with, with him, uh, he reached back out, you know, what Shy Money reached out. Mm -hmm. And it was more or less for the record, but I didn't have, and he was asking me, you know, what's your situation? I was like, man, I ain't never, I, I was never even signed to UTP. Really? I took the contract, put it under my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> I mean, the bed on the bus, right. you know what I'm saying? I was given the contract on the bus, on the, on the road, like, you know what I'm saying? But I don't know, I guess it was God. You know, I never got off into even signing it because I was looking at it like, you know, you know, homie trying to get himself together. So, and right. I knew how in depth it was and how hard and how hard he was pushing to keep everything together. So I couldn't really see, mm -hmm. you know, what I would get out of being signed in that, at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when Know Your Clap was popping, was you around then? Nah, I was, I had already made my, 
you know, my my whole move because gotcha, gotcha. yeah, from there though, it was more of a situation when, you know, we had after we had met Fifty and he had, uh, you know, made the record with him up here, what or what not. We left New York and went across the country to California, and going across the country to California, we was going on Suge Knight's time which I didn't have full recognition or full knowledge of what was going on because Juvenile was the one who was spearheading the business. We left New York and drove from New York to California. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was really the beginning and the ending in a sense because, you know, once we got out there, I spent two weeks or so, you know, in the death row facilities. I'm recording all these different records and Shug's taken to me and, you know, all these different things. And I kind of was reading the situation more of a, like realizing that it wasn't just a juvenile being signed to death row. He was taking himself as well as the crew. I had no idea juvenile was signing to death row. I yeah, didn't know I'm that sure either. I'm sure you didn't. I see a lot of people did and I've been speaking on it because it's, it's at this point, it's like, uh, you know, I just want to give my story. I'm an open book, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So it's like, and I'm, I'm yet to, yet to feel like I've got my just doing this game. So it's not like what I'm putting out there is any false behind it or none of that. You know, at the end of the day, that's the way the direction was supposed to go. And uh, what happened with that? Why didn't it happen? Man, honestly, it's because uh, I honestly don't know Charlemagne to this very day. I ain't even had that conversation with Juvenile, even though I speak on it so much. I haven't had a chance to really see him to see where he at with things. Mm -hmm. Ever since I made the 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 bar, Juvie left me in California. And I don't respect that. I love him too much to beef, so I'm accept that. Mm -hmm. But I'ma just step back and focus on Buck. I'm tired of riding in yours. I'm about to buy my own truck. You know, those are real bars, and I bought my own truck. But when I say that, I'm meaning, you know, I was out there on Juvenile's time. We spent two, three weeks of recording with Shug, and uh, one morning I woke up, you know ready for the same process, you know, went to Juvie's room, didn't get an answer when I knocked at the door, went to his brother's room, like, yo, bro, where your bro at? We gotta get to work, we gotta get over here. Man, I've been looking for him all morning. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he's at. What you mean you don't know where he at? He got the per diem, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he took care of everything, so it caused a turmoil throughout the crew. Mm. Everybody's looking for Juvie, and everybody's going to his brother like, yo, bro, what's going on? Where Juvie at? And then we get that phone call from the hotel. Saying, Time to check out. Y'all need to get out, because Suge had called looking for him, and once his brother had told him Juvie wasn't there, one second later when he hung up, the hotel was calling saying, y'all need to get out. And, uh, you know, honestly, man, I don't know exactly what, you know, happened. I think Juvie had to go take care of legal issues or what or what not. And then, you know, they say he was supposed to sign the contract that day as well. So, like I say, when Juvie gets here or whatever, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, he'll be able to speak mm -hmm. on whatever the case may be. Uh, there's yeah, no beef. There, had to check out, no money. No and money. No and information hungry. on what was going on. It, no information. It was guys that strayed off and ended up staying with females that they had met out there at the time. You know, once I realized what situation I was in, I had to call home. Like I say, I was chasing a check. I didn't have one. Mm. I had to call home, get somebody send me something, you know, and not only send me something, it's two, three other guys trying to get home, so send me enough for them. So I did as much as I could do out for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, Skip and Wack, they'll tell you, I think Wacko got left out there. Mm -hmm. You know, Skip and all of those guys, you know, they, they did what they had to do to get back. Skip ended up having to fly back out there because, you know, during the turmoil, one of the vehicles was left. He mm -hmm. had to fly yeah. back and drive the vehicle back to Damn. New Orleans. So like I say, the experience of that was enough to let me know, okay, let me go ahead and move on. Mm -hmm. And that, like I say, Probably like a week or two later is when I got that call from Shaw Money about the record that I was playing. But in the same time, he was asking what's going on with me. And I'm like, look, man, my situation that was moving with them, I jumped off of it. You know what I'm saying? He was like, what? You know, man, 50, 50 really, really paying attention to you. And I'm like, okay, cool. And uh, next thing I know, the next call was, yo, man, M loved the record. He want to mix the record, bro. And I'm like, M? You talking about Eminem? Mm -hmm. like, you feel <laughs> 
So it started from there. They flew me, so flew you, me out. So you never had a uh, but don't, real quick. You never, you never, Suge never reached out. Like, look, I like what you was doing in the studio. Won't you rock with me? Yeah, I mean, he never reached out. He always, it's like I'm, I'm back and forth throughout LA mm -hmm. my whole life. So he's always had ways to be able to get at me through other individuals and everything. So, you know, he, from the very day I met Suge, you know, he, he, he did a lot of Tupac talking to me, you know. Mm. You remind me of Pac, yeah, yeah, all yeah. That, a lot of different things of that nature, and uh, you know, he expressed to me how much, you know, he enjoyed what he heard from me, and what, you know, how he would love to have me a part of what they had going on. Mm -hmm. So I've always had that mutual respect with Suge. I mean, even before at the Vibe Awards, when that situation happened. Oh, we gonna get to that. Yeah, we'll I that walked in and spoke to the man. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just being real, like honestly, it's more of a situation where I've never had issues with him, but I know he's always been uh, aware of who I am, right. period. And Juvie, you haven't spoken to him since then? No, not at all. I think we're, we're, we have spoken. Oh. We've spoken, but, but we haven't about spoken that, about, about that. that right. You know, it's more of a thing where I see him. Juvie is real close friends to a lot of my friends from my city. You mm. know, he created a relationship. Just the whole cash money thing is like, Nashville, Cashville is almost a second home. You know, people in my city became adapted to seeing Wayne and Juvie and everybody because of my affiliation. And they treated my city in the coming up years as a second home for them, mm -hmm. you know. So it was it was more of a situation where, you know, everybody was used to seeing those guys and kind of looked for me to make my career happen with Cash Money, period. So, you know, even though I haven't had this conversation with them, We've had times where we've seen each other spoke, and whether I brought it up, I've put it out there enough where if it's anything that he want to say or do is there, you know, I'm not looking for no closure out of the situation or nothing. I'm, like I say, I'm not putting no false nothing out there on, or there's no beef or none of that with me or Juvie or none of that type of stuff. I'm just telling it. The right. way it is, yeah. So 50 didn't have to pay Juvie nothing to get you off? Not at he all. He wasn't signed. He, he didn't sign nothing. Yeah. Never signed nothing. And then you go with G-Unit. pay me. And that G-Unit truck was running at that time. Yeah, Y'all really. were moving at that time. Without That's a doubt. That's good that you was moving around for so long without having signed anything anywhere. But yeah, that was the blessing of me. It was because I, I got it out the streets. It was more like, if you ain't got to offer me what I'm already putting myself in, in a position and getting, Mm -hmm. Then it didn't really make sense to me. It was it was more of a thing where uh, I didn't really have a, no a lot of knowledge of the business too, on you know percentages and things of that nature, of how things worked without the business. So you know I was really really fresh up off the block. Like you didn't have a lawyer or anything None to look that. at the contract. You would have probably, if things felt right, just signed it. Yeah. But you signed with Fifty though. Fifty made sure you signed. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. Until then. Fifty a businessman. He was gonna make sure he. <laughs> and he signed. made sure I had a million dollars before I even put an album out. Right. Wow. Straight up, I was a millionaire by by the time we got off the rock the mic tour by just being on the stage with mm -hmm. Fifty. But you said you said Shot Money called you. So two mm -hmm. Cali happened. Two weeks later, Shot Money called you. Mm -hmm. And then what? Uh. Once Shot Money called me, I came on out there. He wanted to fly me out to L.A. Uh, to basically. You wasn't scared? Like, God damn, L.A. again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just more or less, let's go. You yeah. for real, bitch. Right. Time to get up out of here. But when I got out there, they were recording at Dre spot. It was the first time I got to see Dre. I didn't get a chance to talk to him then. I was more or less just there, you know. And uh, my my whole situation started to brew from there. You know, that's when 50 let me know, look, man, you know, I'm looking to bring you over here if you're with it. Did you feel cautious because this is like the third time something like this? It was really the hundredth time. This was like the fourth time. It's like the fourth. It's like the fourth time. Fourth and you time. Like, Cash yeah, money, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, and now, yeah. yeah, this is the fourth at okay. that time. It was more of a situation where I was like, you know, is this really real? Mm -hmm. You know, you sitting there by Dre and them and them and, them and all of that. And, it, honestly, I didn't even feel like my music was up to that par where they were off into it like that. He's mm -hmm. telling me Eminem want to mix my record. I just couldn't see it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So from there, uh, like I say, my whole situation started from that moment on. Um, 50 was like, you know, we're going to jump straight into it. I'll get this paperwork pulled up. You can run it through your lawyers or whatever you need to do. I'll let you know what I'm looking to do. And if you see fit for it, let's go forward with mm -hmm. it. And uh, 
honestly, man, that was it right there. That's what that's what it took. I went, got me a lawyer, of course. Uh, at the time, I was dealing with a manager. Well, he wasn't my manager. He was Juvenile's manager, Ron Bird. Shout out to Ron Bird. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was kind of looking for him to come over and manage me out of the situation because, I, like I say, I didn't have no knowledge of the business or what was going on. And, I had enough knowledge that what he was asking for at the time wasn't what I felt like I was able to produce. So that didn't work. And I walked into G Unit with just nothing but me mm -hmm. and a lawyer mm -hmm. that I barely had a relationship with. So it was more or less an experience of learning. That's why it led to the trials and tribulations that I've done been through business wise, is because I done had to gain my own education behind the own behind other people's education of this business. Versus like a come, trial by fire kind yeah, of. Yeah, other than come, I come from the independent hustle. Yeah, I was going to ask, because you made a lot of money, but then there was a, a, a bunch of times where they said you had no money. Like, you, yeah. you lost everything. How did you How lose did I, all your money? Honestly, it was more of a situation where, you know, I had no knowledge of legal money and how that rotated. I always done got a hold of the paper and put it up in something mm -hmm. throughout my whole life. So when, you know, I come off this Rock the Mic tour and, 50 telling me, yo, that account that I told you to set up, you need to go check it. And then I go over there and check the, the, the account in and that, that thing's zero, 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 zero millions. I came back to 50 like, yo, bro, did you give me the right? The right amount? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Word, like, did you make a mistake? And he laughed at it like, yo, that's yours. So but they ain't tell you about taxes. Nah, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. That's so where half of this is yours. He forgot to tell, forgot to tell me half of it was mine. <laughs> so I went, ran, done everything what I was supposed to do. When, when you when you when you checked it. Well, I bought, of course, jewelry, cars, <laughs> all the essential. <laughs> Uh, a new rapper, hip hop, hip -hop, rap, rap, hip -hop one. there you starter go. Pack. So the starter kit, I went and got the starter kit, the the the, the Bentleys, the jewelry. Uh, got me a big old house. One of the biggest mistakes I made was not buying my homes. You know, I, I was leasing to buy my homes. Mm. Put out all this money on my home. Put all this money on, down on my mother's home. Uh, you know, bought a few cars, leasing a few cars. Sheesh. Next thing I know, I look up. And that one zero 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 is just zero. And then you get that knock at the door. Of this individual talking Last about time. where mine is. Mm -hmm. So then I, at the beginning, when I went to fifty, like yo, bro, you know these folks talking about I owe this in taxes off of the money. Like he, it was, a, it was. I ain't gonna say a joke, but he laughed about it. It was more like, how do you know? You know, man, this is what you need to do. You know, I'll take care of it. You know what I'm saying? That was real though. When I even when I heard that fifty paid the taxes, I was like, that's yeah, real. Yeah. How much in taxes did he have to pay? I don't know exactly what it was, that amount was. I think uh, he pa he paid on it. I still had a debt, but he paid some. You know how you could pay him, yeah. reconstruct and pay on right, it right, right. type of situation. He paid enough on it. I still had situations covered in to take care of my own business. But in that process, I think that's when we started to have our differences. You and Fifth? Yeah. Why, why was that? I just don't honestly feel for uh, he didn't see fit for the way I was carrying myself at times with individuals. I think that he, he was had problems with the world, with. And, and he wanted he wanted to make sure everybody was riding with him. And he's supposed to in the end, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, at the same time, I was more or less focused on the fact that you know, with some of the individuals, I didn't have a personal situation with, mm -hmm. versus then him being big bro and having these situations. So it was kind of hard for me at that time when you know. He having in, he having you know certain beats with individuals, and then I run into these individuals and they looking to give me all the love in the world when I'm basically there to tear their head off. You know what I'm who saying? Who was the biggest one that he yeah, had a problem it, with? Who wasn't it? Somebody in particular was it the game or the murder angle? Was it at the time? Was it me, Ross? Or who was at it? the time it was, of course, murder ink. That was in the beginning, but you had a uh, Fat Joe. You know what I'm saying? Fat Joe, Joe. It was. They say you saw it. You shook his hand or something like that. Yeah. I, well. No, I never, I never saw Fat Joe to shake his hand. Me and me and Fat Joe had a small brief running in in Chicago. We had words back and forth type of situation. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Fat Joe and them because him and Fifty, they they was able to move on. Lost to yeah. be right. Uh, game, of course, at that situation. You know what I'm saying? Uh, even with the locks, you know, it was kind of hard, especially with the relationship I got with Jada. Me and Jada had just kind of got, you know, acquainted with each other. Well, you know, we on the bus chilling with each other, and then the next week or two, piggy bank comes up. There you go. So it was, <laughs> it was like, man, 
you know, it was just it was just that whole navigation of that situation, you know, even with, I think even with the uh with the dip set, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It got to the point where I was going to see what was up. You know, if I knew that these guys were somewhere around me, man, I'm not going to see here and act like I don't know you over here or not know that we on the same bill. I'm going to see what it is. And a few of them, they were able to stay in ground at least enough with me where I was able to come back and say, 50, no, man, I don't think these dudes really own that. And Jim was one of them. Shout out to Jim John. He was one that was like, man, I ain't really on that. And that's why y'all see back in the G where Jim Jones was able to come out on BET mm -hmm. in the midst of that whole turmoil. It was more or less when 50, once we was there, uh, 50 was like, man, uh, you know, go down, go down, down there and tell dude to come, come holler because I was able to let 50 know, man, you know, it ain't that, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So it was just about being loyal to 50. In retrospect, do you think you handled it properly or you wish you would have did it differently? If you look at it now. I don't, I don't look like I should have did nothing different because I'm still here and I'm still relevant. So mm -hmm. I, when you ask me that, it's kind of hard for me to say I would have did anything in my life. I mean, different. when you talk about loyalty, like, do you understand where he's coming from and feel like, well, maybe I, you know, should have been more loyal? Or do you feel like he was being out of pocket? I feel like, uh, you know, he was doing what anybody would do that, that's created a crew of brothers and created a brand and the brand that we've created and came up under have issues. It was more of a thing. I think 50 was looking at it like uh, we came in it together. We might as well go out if, if that's the play. Mm -hmm. So do I look at some of the things that I've done in the midst of as far as uh, not having a problem with certain individuals he had problems with? No, I don't think I was wrong at all about that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because it would have been fake on my end. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make a problem with somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, what I did start to realize is what I would give off that character of I don't have a problem with you, but then the ones would give the character off, like I got a problem with you, it would turn me immediately to like, let me see what's up. Meaning that I would basically put it there like I'm not tripping off dude or whatever the case and then they would come out with a record and mm -hmm. they didn't hold back on sending any kind of disses my way or mm -hmm. what or what not you know what I'm saying it is what it is at this point you know it was just a time in hip hop where it was so real honestly I look at where things is at now with the whole social media thing and how it is now and you're I, like, why nobody getting shot? Right. That's it. I'm being as honest as I can. <laughs> now, you know, man, you know, honestly, if social media was back then where it's at now, I think it would be so many dead rappers. Right. You know, and so much more because things were so realer than it was. You know, you, you had to at least address your situations or you would have been addressed, at least when it comes to the unit. Um, now it's more or less who can say the most crazy -ish. craziness or yeah. make the most ridiculous meme. ridiculous meme they can find yeah. you know what i'm saying and it's cool you know i guess because for me i'm so focused on you know the reality of where things is at when it comes to this music the reality of my life i've always wore my you know life on my shoulders and implicated it through the music so when you get my music and you hearing what you're getting from me, I got to be careful when I'm creating this mm -hmm. because it's so real, you know, not to, to, to protect myself and others. But I've always felt like the only way that these individuals is, or people in itself is going to be a true fan of yours mm -hmm. is if they're able to pull something out of what you're speaking on and either say, I'm going through it or I know somebody going through it. Right. So I really kind of stray away from the make-believe situations and rap in the next individual's life and things of that nature. I mean, not to say I won't reference to something that, you know, I haven't touched bases on, but I was there. You know, I kind of stay away from a lot of things that they do with it because that's just the way I choose to, uh, you know, push my line with what I got going on. I'd rather keep it on a reality rap. And even with my new single, if you if you pay attention to it, uh, and the words that I'm speaking on, you know, it's it's real. It's not it's not a, a situation where I'm just basically creating, talking to talk. just talking to talk, you right. know? How did you feel when 50 put the phone call of you out crying or whatever it was? 
at the time I felt like, man, you you, you tripping basically. Mm -hmm. um, it really wasn't bad to me. I'm gonna keep it real with you. It was more like, man, you did that. Yeah, y'all supposed to be brothers. We supposed to be bro. Like you, it was more like, man, you captivating the moment of me becoming emotional of a situation dealing with you. I don't know if you was to put that there to make me look as a weak individual or whatever the case may be. But I think overall, uh, I don't think Fifty was paying attention to the fact that. You know, it's not it's not wrong to shed tears, especially about individuals or anybody who you you know. As a man, of course, we 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 got this thing about ourselves where, you know, crying is not the 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 way of giving it off, especially to another man. But my thing wasn't a face to face crying in front of fifty. It was more or less I became emotional out of the conversation. I haven't seen him, you know. It, it was more like this is my brother. I'm I got these situations. And, uh, you know, that actual phone call was held, you know. Now, the time he released it was perfect. <laughs> you know? how did, how did but you was apologizing, that? though. Yeah, That's the thing. I, like, it, I didn't understand. Like, you was giving it up to him. Like, I was wrong. Right. Right. And I never understood that part neither. How mm -hmm. did y'all clear that up? How did y'all talk about that after? How did y'all become cool after all of that? The time healed everything. Mm -hmm. I never spoke to 50 for seven years. Mm -hmm. Straight. Not a text, not a phone call, nothing. So how Yayo did, and, and um, neither Roy, one of them. None of them. So how did y'all finally speak? Because honestly, my, I went to prison and when I went to prison, I, I started to rehabilitate my situation of what I wanted to do when I got out. And uh, I just started reflecting back on where I've been at. I found myself sitting in prison as a millionaire. I done done all this life and I can sit here and talk about where I done came from in the streets, finally get to a level in life where you, they consider you made it. And here I am sitting in you know, the penitentiary. So when I, I made a decision to myself, when I get out, I would stretch out just to, for clarity for mm -hmm. myself. It, I went to prison fighting fit. You know what I'm saying? I went to prison with nothing. I lost everything. Uh, I lost my house, my mother's house, all my cars, you know, they came, took everything out of my house. And then here it is, I'm fighting to be off a contract at the time, you know, to be able to get out and make money because he wasn't allowing me to do so much at the time or allowing me to do things. So I'm fighting, you know, both situations. And I just said, enough is enough. So when I came home, I stressed out to 50 and, uh, you know, he had he reached back. He was like, uh, you know, let's see what let's see what we can come up with. Mm -hmm. And uh that's when I had flew up here and uh we had a face to face sit down. He explained to me, you know, some of the differences of, of the the way he was feeling at the time. And then honestly, just to be real, I think when we both kinda got out on both sides of things it was more or less where we realized it was more of a big misunderstanding than any kind of beef. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really made him say, you know what, let's go back at this again. Because once he got clarification out of the situation as well as me, it was like, man, we don't wasted all this time, man. You know, 50 got morals and he, he live on them and stand on them, but I do too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where we clashed at. You know, he got morals and he's loyal to certain things. I got morals, I'm loyal to certain things. He's his own man, I'm my own man. So, you know, in a group or when you have that type of situation, you know, you're gonna have disagreements. And in our disagreement, I think it was more of a, a situation where with him being the boss and my disagreement and him being the boss, he gets the final say so on whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I may not agree with whatever that final say so on whatever it is. And uh, if I didn't agree with it, then that's what that's what how it kind of fell out to be. You never well, wanted to leave G Unit, like I I seen recently that Lloyd Banks is, is off of G Unit now. That you never wanted to go that route. You figured this was was best for for Buck. I mean, you kind of did. I did yeah. in, in the beginning. Uh, I mean, you know, once we fell out and in the midst of those seven years of not having no communication, mm -hmm. I wouldn't just sit in the brown just uh uh. uh 
doing nothing. Still on G unit. I was biting back at 50. He was right. biting, trying to bite my head off. I was trying to bite his head off back. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I had to defend, you know, who I am and, and my character and everything I stand for on the microphone. And he was, you know, pushing his lines and throwing his bars there. So I was in a p position where I realized, of course, I can't fight this man financially. Only thing I can do is, is keep giving my truth. So throughout my music and mm -hmm. whatever I would speak on, I was giving my truth versus then trying to create something fake and right. just to get attention. It was just more or less, okay, you you, you this you, you you got me on that one, but this is what it really is. Right. And uh, you know that that was the whole thing about my situation. It was more of a, you know, we had this big misunderstanding, mm -hmm. and at the time of the misunderstanding. I was trying my best to get off G-Unit, mm -hmm. you know, and then once I, you know, went to prison, like I just explained, and came to terms about mm -hmm. where I was at, that's when I made the decision to, man, this is where I need to be. Let me go ahead and get back <laughs> over that with out, my right? brother, squash that out. Did and anybody in that shady aftermath G-Unit circle try to reach out? Because, I mean, you did stab somebody for Dr. Dre. That gotta, <laughs> that gotta mean something. Allegedly. N right? Allegedly, right. Uh, nah. Nah, ain't nobody ever stressed out to me, Charlemagne. None of them. Not, not nobody. Not when Dre, I, not M, no. Not, no, nobody. When just, I, not even just Dre M, man. I had relationships with so many different guys that I considered friends this of, of in this industry. Like Rosenberg, who Rosenberg M's manager? Nah, nah, not, not none of them reached out. Okay. I mean actual artists. Like, you know, a lot of these artists that I've created relationships with was I realized I created the relationship with, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't looking at it as that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I I took the platform that we had as far as G Unit of two thousand two and two thousand three and literally being at our peak, I would hand my platform to to different individuals that were on there come up, you know. And uh, like I say, when I found myself in trials and tribulations. Nobody was there. None of them. So anybody that you may see me have any kind of relationship with in this industry from any kind of perspective and rapper you ever see me on a picture with, the only individual I can truly honestly say is Boosie and 2 Chains. Mm. Mm straight up, like this always really truly like was there, you know what I'm, I mean? Of course, even, now one thing I will say, you know, you had individuals that was there, mm -hmm. but they wasn't the individuals who were in this industry. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I, I can't speak on nobody who even came to, I didn't get one visit in prison. Both sentences. Not one? Not one. I, I didn't allow my family or children to come see me because I didn't want them to be staying with the memory of where I was at at the time. But the fact I had an outdate and it wasn't, I mean, it's a, it wasn't long compared. My selling now had life. You know, everybody throughout the penitentiary had at least 10 to 15 years or better. I sit in the federal system with the smallest sentence in the penitentiary that I've ever seen, you know, compared to these guys that I was amongst. I got out. Stayed out for a year and a half. I catch one misdemeanor situation and got sent right back to prison for a year. You know what I'm saying? So my situation is so delicate when it comes to me even going to prison. Mm -hmm. I ain't never even, if we gonna just get all the way real, I never even touched the gun that I went to prison for. Never even know that it was even in my home. You know, but I will say this. So you went to jail for somebody else basically? In a sense, you know, they first questions to me, you know, was, you know, we want to ask you reasonable questions about ind certain individuals. If you can provide us some reasonable answers, then we'll take prison off the table. Mm. And, uh, you know, of course, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. You know what I'm saying? Like anybody you would ask me about, I would possibly be lying about mm -hmm. if that's the case, you know. So for me, it was more of a situation like, uh, I see why, I see where this is going at because I choose not to uh, cooperate in whatever they felt like I, they wanted me to cooperate in. And uh, the DA told me, you know, if you don't cooperate, I'm gonna send you to prison. And uh, that's exactly what he did. And I told him too, straight up, go ahead, get me ready then. Go ahead, ready, send me on to prison. You know, He kept his word. He kept his word. Now what happened the night of the, the Vibe Awards? 
when you stab somebody for Dr. Dre. Let's talk about that night. Cause you a said, lot of kids don't know that. That's a great story. They said, so. you, you, cause yeah. they said you you walked in and you said, what's man, you crazy, man. <laughs> you got to be the livest dude in the world. I swear. Like, on this interview, dude, it's crazy, man. They said, they said you, you you said you spoke to Suge Knight before you walked in as a, hey, what's going on? Yeah, it was, it was look. So you walked in there, and, 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 and what was the scene? Set the scene for the kids and, and everybody that don't know. Uh, <laughs> man, it was the Vibe Awards. Uh, the whole team was there. It was the first time we all been collectively together. I mean, me, Banks, Yayo, 50, Dre, mm -hmm. M, Game, everybody. We all was sitting at, at, at a table. But on the entrance of walking in, I was walking with uh, B, 50, I think M and Dre was there. And uh, Petey Pablo at the time was with Suge. They was off to the side. And I'm enter entering the actual, you know, auditorium or what or whatnot with Dre, M, and, mm -hmm. and then I look and hear Suge like, Buck, come here. So that right there immediately was- it Was the start. Right. Because here it is, he's hollering, Buck, come here. But you were Dre. So he's doing that to try to son Dre. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's so weird. I, I, that's uh, awkward. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I looked at 50 like, I'm gonna go holler to see what he on. So I went over there and and I went and, and what up? And he hit me with the regular though. What up, bro? I see you doing your thing. P, me and Petey had a record at the time, Petey Pablo. Salute to Petey. Yeah, and he was like, yo, Petey. bro, we killing it, whoop the whoop and all that good stuff. So we hollered and it was nothing from that. I never felt like it was any negative no bad energy, energy or what, what, nothing like that. Suge didn't do no indications of he was doing. And even to this day, you know, I don't know what and who had anything to do with anything. So I'm not even sitting here saying Suge had a damn thing to do with nothing. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was more or less in a situation where, you know, I, I walked in, he spoke based off the relationships that we had already had that I done spoke on, what we created with Juvenile. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when he spoke, I went on to the table. But I got that vibe of, I didn't feel right in there because mm -hmm. I looked around and everybody who we had issues with at the time was there. We sitting in the middle of Charlemagne. You got, you know, Murder Inc., Chris Gotti, all them dudes over there, whatever, on the left hand side, and, you know, Death Row dudes back <laughs> here and all that. Like, Sheesh. it was more of like we surrounded with all these different individuals. So, right. if you catch a picture that they got out, you kind of notice where everybody's at the table and bucks around like this. Because I'm looking at these dudes in the eyes. Like, mm -hmm. what are y'all on in here? Yeah, right. Something might go down. Something might go down. Yeah. I didn't want to move from that table because I felt it that much, but I had to because we had to present the next award, me and Banks. So, you know, of course, they pick us up to walk us to the stage, and I get to the stage, and, uh, you know, we were paying attention to the teleprompter to know our cue when to walk on, and that's when we seen the commotion go crazy through the teleprompter. Uh, tell a thing and uh, when I walked to the front of the stage like I said I had no idea who the commotion was with or what I honestly thought it was with 50 so I get to the front of the stage I'm looking I'm looking I'm looking for 50 and I don't see him I didn't see 50 or pretty much nobody but I look and I see Dre you know going for what he he know Dre you know was throwing blows Dre was trying to make sure he come up out that thing. Dre you was know trying to get saying? out of Dodge. <laughs> he wasn't playing with him, Beast though. by Dre for real? Beast by, Beast Beast by Dre. Beast <laughs> by Dre ain't doing no playing, man. Yeah. When it come to, the muscles ain't there for no play. I don't mm -hmm. know what individuals they, but Dre was doing what he had to do, you know, in that situation. And, uh, you know, like I say, some big dudes he was he was pushing his line with at the time, and it was more like, uh, nah, this can't happen like this. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't know, man. I, I jumped off the stage and... <laughs> All of a sudden, one of the individuals that was that was right there really giving Dre a little hard time, I seen him buckle to his knees and fall and oh, and the next thing I was gone, you know what I'm saying? So I don't really know exactly how things so panned did you, out. Did you, did you <laughs> sneak a knife in the Vibe Awards? Or did you grab something off, off the, the table? table? There goes Charlemagne with that thing <laughs> again, bro. It was a fork on the table. <laughs> oh, it was a fork. Yeah, it was a fork, fork on the table. Right. Charlamagne went, when whatever went down, I looked over there and I seen dude messed up. So I like, they gonna think I done it. So I picked up the <laughs> fork and waved the fork around. That fork saved my life because I picked up the fork and made sure I turned around, you know, like this. 
because I'm knowing cameras everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Throwed the fork. You know, when I throwed the fork, that was my whole thing, man. I ain't done nothing to nobody. I had a fork in my hand mm. in the midst of the trial. You know what I'm saying? And I had a fork, bro. What That's do y'all say? Everybody seen? was like, he stabbed him with a fork. Stabbed him with a fork. And then they were more or less like, <laughs> no, you didn't. I'm like, well, yes, I did. And then they said, well, we're going to send a forensics team in there. And out of grace of God, they sent the forensics team in there. And out of all the forks in that building, they found the one fork <laughs> they had your with my fingerprint. <laughs> Yikes. Straight up and down. So, you know, that helped, you know, and the situation, basically I walked away from uh, that situation going from a attempted, attempted murder. Later it was dropped to a aggravated assault and then it was dropped to a simple assault with nothing but three years of unsupervised provision, uh, mm -hmm. probation to serve. After I completed that, it had been six years later, but that's the felony that they used to convict me mm. with the gun charge. Wow. Got you. It was so crazy that I even went back out. Like I say, it's six years later. Mm -hmm. I only had three years of it. I went back at the time. I'm arguing with the judge. Hey, man, this felony that you even trying to use to send me to federal prison with, I completed that three years ago. Man, I can go out here and get it taken care of. We went and done it. And before I even went and court started, Technically, I didn't even have a felony because, I, like I say, that was the only felony. You got expunged, that, yeah. And got it expunged. But even the judge the judge said, uh, you was a felony. You was charged as a felony at the time you got the case, and we going forward with it. Wow. So, you know, like I say, long story short, my lawyer at the time is now the head of the whole district attorney of my city. Hmm. Wow. So I was kind of kind of in one of them situations where it was like, uh, we need that vote. Give me that vote for this conviction. This is the biggest conviction our city ever had. We'd be able to send Buck to prison. I need your vote, though. That's what I think that's mm. what it was all about because uh, I got numerous of individuals around me that's been caught with numerous of guns and never been to prison. But they needed that Buck name for that they vote. They needed that Buck name for that, bu that vote and that conviction. And so I went down my time, did it, it's back behind me. I'm so focused on where I got to go now because of what I done been through then. So Dre owe you a couple beats. Yeah just, yeah, just to put a button on that. Did Dr. Dre say thank you? Yeah, he owe you a couple At beats. At least now. Did he... I'm going to be real. The honest, phone, something. I just talked to Dre for the first time probably, probably 30 days ago. Mm. Isn't he executive producing your album? We Him and 50? We on it. <laughs> we on really? It. Yeah, I'm Okay, that's it. the O. Oh, he owe. Oh, you know yeah, what he owe? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, honestly, man, it was more a situation where... I brought it to 50, I'm like, yo, Phil, I wanna make this exciting. Like, I need, I'm trying to chase that feel again. You know what I'm saying? Not just through the music, but through the aura of the way it's mm -hmm. been, the way we had, the way it's moved, you know, with the whole Shady Aftermath G on this situation. And I'm watching, you know, the crews basically uh, want the same thing as well. So I figure, you know what, let me captain of the ship this thing. I put myself out there on a limb in a sense. You know, I've been working out there with Battle Cat, mm -hmm. and uh, Battle Cat got a real close relationship with Drake. And Battle Cat, like, yo, bro, I'm gonna be honest, man, this music that you're making, I haven't heard nothing like this of course, since Pac and all of that good stuff. He's like, man, I got to holler at Drake. So I'm like, hold on, what? Like I say, I don't have even the ways in getting in touch with him. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, bro, listen, I've just been trying to speak to Drake, bro. Since I stabbed somebody for him. Allegedly. Allegedly. Pretty Allegedly. much. Yes. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly, right? Allegedly. So he like, you know, uh, man, I'm going to get him on the phone, man, honestly, man. And, uh, man, he got Dre right there on the phone. I was like, yo, Dre, what up, bro? Uh, I got a lot to say, but most of all, Dre, man, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, create a project, man. If you looking, if you would just pay me some attention right now at this point, I'm at the best I've ever been. He like, where you at? Pull up. Wow. And honestly, man, he thought I was in LA. I was in Seattle at the I'd time. I'd have pulled up still. I'd be like, I'd be in On oh, my hours. mama, I tried. I literally <laughs> tried. And he was on his way uh, in LA at the time to go uh, to Coachella. Mm -hmm. He was just like, man, I'm on my way to Coachella real quick. And as uh, soon as I get back, man, just pull up and we'll go from there. So. Got to 50 a few days ago. Mm -hmm. Yo, Phil, what's the deal, bro? 
you know, uh, you know, my projects is serious, but would you be opposed to Dre executive producing my project? And 50 really was like, you know what? Of course not. I'm all for it. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, that's a that's that's big. Yeah, I want to do it. Yeah, I'll do it. So that's where you have me, you know, really pushing the line at this point now because I done got Fifty's blessing out of it. Mm -hmm. So if I can, uh, you know, it ain't even just about Dre. You know, I want to have a quick powwow with Eminem. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to focus at this point. I heard hey, G Unit might be signing the Def Jam. Is that the rumor that's out there? So you started that. Not, no, I think it was a picture of 50 posted with Paul Rosenberg. Now, they might say that I started it because yeah, was, I've been I forgot, speaking on, on somebody's show. I forgot who you showed you. Yeah, I, honestly, I got G on the South. Cashville Records is my company. G on the South is the label. I got a lot of artists. I got like four or five artists right now that's super duper crazy. And 50 was like, you know, uh, he asked me would I be interested in, in, in taking my situation over that way. And I told him, yeah. You know, if, if it's a possibility and it works out that way, of course, I wouldn't mind taking my situation to Def Jam, especially with Paul being over there. Uh, me understanding Paul in business, and he plays no games with things. So, yeah. of course, you know what I'm saying? I would love to be over there and and take what I got going over there. But far as actual G-Unit as a company, nah, I think it's more of a G-Unit South and what, gotcha. what I got going on, yeah. What's the name of the new album going to be? Unexpected. Unexpected. Executive produced by Dr. Dre and 50 Cent. That's the, that's the motto. That's there how we go. looking, you know? Unexpected, I feel like everything that's happening for me is unexpected. You know, this record that I put out, you know, the type of record was unexpected. Nobody expected to hear what they what they getting out of this single, mm -hmm. Can't Lose, from me. Uh, everything just unexpected. Even if you ask me when it comes out, I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be it's unexpected. It's going to be unexpected. <laughs> so it's like everything, my whole career, the way I'm moving, you know, Everything is unexpected. I felt like that's just the perfect title for my project, you know? All right. Well, we appreciate you for joining us. Yeah, I, just got, I got one quick question. You think that when you, when you got on with G-Unit, Yayo being in prison helped you out? Because they kind of needed that yeah. third guy? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And uh, it almost caused a little confusion with me and Yayo, I think, you know? You thought you was replacing him? Yeah. I think he was more like, hold on, man, I'm Yayo. You know, so I made sure that, he, that the world would know I'm Buck. You feel what I'm saying? And I'm not Yayo, I'm not trying to be Yayo. Uh, Yayo is one of my closest, bro. We was just together yesterday. Like I say, man, our situations of being separated for so long has made our bond stronger right. than they ever been. Have you spoke to Banks? Not since I've been out here, mm -hmm. but I'm on my way if he's listening right now. I'm coming out there regardless. You're going to have to speak to me regardless. See, I'm coming to knock on the door. You're going to Long Island. Yeah, okay. I'm headed out that way. You got to explain, I, I need to speak to you, you know what I mean? I, I need to know what's going on. I don't think we need to do a phone conversation or none of that. I'd rather get in front of my brother face to face, see where mm -hmm. he's staying at. Because one thing I can say about Banks is, of course, I won't ever want to see my brother nowhere outside of G-Unit. This is what we started. This is where I feel like we all, you know, need to keep our thing at. But if it don't work that way, one thing I can say is uh, I think Banks gonna be good regardless in anything he do. He's one of the best lyricists that I've mm -hmm. I've always stood behind that. You know, I think he's one of the most talented artists that we have. And uh, I just hope we can keep the situation, you know, with whatever is going on in-house and he can work out whatever situation that he got going on with 50. And uh, we, we, we get straight to it right now, man. All right. Well, there you have it. It's Young Buck. Young Buck. Yeah, man. It's the breakfast.